Okay, grab your Bible or your phone or whatever you do to look up Scripture, and we're going to turn to Galatians in chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16 and go down through verse 25. We learned a big truth from last week. <clears throat> we are always filled with something. Remember, um, I held up, if you were here last week or watched online, I held up my mug here and I said, you know, I, when I'm finished with this tea, the tea is gone. And I think two of you got the answer right. So you go, you two. You know who you are. When the tea is gone, we say it's empty, but really what is in there? Air. air. Okay, now we're up to four this week. Great. There's air. It's never empty. There's always something in here. And it's the same thing with our lives. If we're going to be full of God's Spirit working in our lives, we need to drain ourselves of ourselves. We can't be full of the Spirit and full of ourselves or full of our natural desires at the same time. Are we connecting on this? It's kind of like one or the other. And that's what the scripture we're going to talk about today goes through. The process of God filling me begins with me removing or emptying the other junk that would take his place, that inhibit his spirit's work. And there's no greater passage that deals with it than the one that we're going to walk through today in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 down to 21. So hopefully you're there by now. I'm going to put it up on the screen for those who would like to follow along that way. Here's how it reads. Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, notice the contrast here. Because the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. And they're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the acts of the flesh are obvious. And Paul mentions 15 to get us started looking at this. Here's what they are. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So how do I know what is of the Spirit of God, and how do I know what is of my flesh? How can I discern the difference between these two things? Well, thankfully, the text makes it pretty obvious for us today to be able to discern them. But here's one thing that we need to get down, and I, I'm going to need us all to understand this, to embrace this, to realize the truth of this. We need to be honest. We need to be honest about the obvious. We need to be honest about our fleshly desires. We need to be honest that there is a struggle inside of every single one of us. And we need to be convinced of that by the time this service is done. There's a word here that we need to understand. It's what's in us. And here's what it is. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify, here's the word, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. So the word desires, here's what it means. It means heat, passion, and it actually refers in its original root word to intoxicating wine. This is what desire does to us. When we are intoxicated, we are impaired in our judgment. 
We cannot reason things out well. We think we're capable of handling things that we truly can't handle. And so here in these desires, he's saying, you know what? There's an influence. When you're intoxicated with your desires, you're driving under the influence of them. They influence us to do things that don't always make sense. And we have all heard about driving under the influence. Well, here we can live under the influence of our desires. Now, I really don't have um, any alcohol stories to share with you, intoxicating stories to share with you, except for one. This is when I was um, at Baptist Bible College in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, and I was on a singing tour group, and we were going up and down the East Coast, and we were on this big tour bus. And as we were coming back to campus, we were one mile away from campus, and we were about to take this sharp right-hand turn onto the road that goes to the college, and it was at 5 a.m. in the morning, so we're all conked. We're all sleeping on this tour bus. Thankfully, the driver was wide awake, and he, in order to make this right-hand turn, he kind of made it a little bit wider on purpose. That way, this big tour bus could make that turn. This is at 5 a.m., and we're in a 35-mile-an-hour speed zone and i'm telling you here's what happened when he's making that right hand turn a vehicle decided to try to pass us on the right and they must have been doing 60 70 miles an hour and as they decided to pass us on the right they hit the front of the tour bus they veered off hit a rock wall ricocheted off that went across the road through these people's bushes and up onto their front porch This is at 5 a.m. We all woke up on the tour bus. And I remember looking out the window, and I saw the guy get out of his car. And he he was drunk. He was impaired. And he goes up to the to the doorbell of the home and he starts ringing it. Well, of course, I think they've already may have been awake, like a car on your porch would may maybe wake you up. But he's ringing the doorbell, and they came out, and he wanted, he wanted to use their phone so he could get a ride. Well, the police showed up, and he did get a ride, a free ride. But this is the word desires. When one is under the influence of something, it holds great sway over their decisions, over their actions, When we are under the influence of our natural desires, we do things that don't make sense intellectually. But we are so compelled and influenced by those intoxicating desires. Probably the best example I could give you this morning is Samson, the strongest man in the Bible Recorded and his strength came from the Spirit of God coming in him and coming in him and he made promises to God One of those is that he would not cut his hair Now if you remember how it goes, let's follow along together a woman a Philistine woman came along and her name was Delilah Well, obviously the Philistines are the enemies of the Israelites of whom Samson is a part, and here Delilah comes from enemy territory, and she is appealing to his sexual desires. And she says, Samson, tell me the source of your strength. Well, he starts playing along, and he he gives her some phony baloney thing, and, and so while she tries that while he's sleeping... And then she wakes him up, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he just gets up and and busts them away and shoves them away and beats them all up. And, you know, at that moment, would we not wonder, would it start to connect up here? Like, maybe I should be questioning Delilah. But we're on the outside. He's being strung along by his desires, his intoxicating desires. They impair judgment. And then she says, okay, 
you're hurting my feelings. I do all of this for you, and you're still not being honest with me. Tell me the source of your strength. And then he says, oh, well, if you braid my hair. And so after their sexual encounter and he's asleep, she's braiding his hair. And then she wakes him up. Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He gets up and busts him off and beats him up, and they all leave. And then she's really crying, like, oh, Samson, how come you won't be honest with me? And now we're all on the outside watching this horror flick saying, what are you doing? Samson, you don't make any sense. And just like someone under the influence, I, I can drive this car. I've got it. I've got it down pat. I can do this. I'm just fine. I can handle it all. And, and he ends up telling her the source of his strength is if you shave my hair, cut my hair, and the Spirit of God will leave, and I'll be just like any other man. And it was lights out. And I'm telling you, literally lights out because he woke up, the Philistines jumped on him, he couldn't do anything, and they pulled his eyeballs out of his sockets. And they beat him and they chained him and he was in servitude and everything changed from that moment on. That's the lesson of desires. That's what they do. He lingered, he thought he could drive under the influence and it cost him everything. Now, here we are. We started this discussion by saying we need to be honest about this. And I know we're in church, and I know we all look good. But can we be honest? Every single one of us, there's no one excluded in this building or the, on the other side of the lens. Every single one of us has intoxicating desires that we deal with. Am I speaking truth with us here? We all do. They're natural. They are set inside. Like we think about drink as coming from the outside. This is something that is preset in us. We all struggle in these ways. And so Paul says, let's get specific. And he, and he does. He lays out 15 things. There are things desires that creep up from within that would keep us from being filled with God's Spirit. And ultimately, they will take us down. Now, let's just walk through this here in a minute. He says, you know, these desires are obvious. They are visible. They are clear. They are well-known. Even people in regular society would say, yeah, I would think that would be out of bounds. So let's look at it here for a moment. He gives 15 things and if you're taking notes, get, get ready. Stretch your fingers out because I'm going to give you these 15 things. I'm going to give you a little definition, description with it. But let's pound these out. These are things, these are desires that everyone deals with in one way or another. The very first one is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. I don't think that these are in an order of importance or you know, this is the most significant down to the other. I think everyone struggles in different ways, but I would say our society, the church is not exempt, all deal with the issue of sexual immorality. Now, here's the Greek word for this sexual immorality. You ready for it? It is pornea. Pornea. And what word do we get from pornea? Pornography. And the word pornea means I'm selling something of great worth for very little. It means to sell off. And so here we have something of great value from God that's been designed for a marriage relationship and union. And our tendency from within is to sell that off for something of lesser value. And it is everywhere. It is everywhere. We don't need external influence, but man, it is, it is all over the place. Pornea, sexual immorality. Here's number two. I'm going to move through these a little bit quicker. Impurity. Impurity. And this word is broader than sexuality. It relates to, just think of it, contamination. 
This is mostly tea, but if you put in a little bit of something else, it's now contaminated. It's impure. And so he's getting at, he's talking about all of these ideals. You know what? You can have something and it kind of sounds good. It kind of seems good. But you know what? It is contaminated. It is infecting. And that can be anything with our language, with our relationships, with our situations, with our influences from without. There's impurity. There is contamination. Number three, just to move through these, debauchery is not a word that we use often, but it means I'm rejecting restraints. I'm uninhibited. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Debauchery. Idolatry. Misplaced worship. Things rank in my heart above God. He's not the primary worship object, but these other things that I'm dwelling on that I desire, they truly are. Here's the next one. It's witchcraft. I'm going to give you the Greek word for this one. You tell me where this belongs. The Greek word for witchcraft, pharmakia. And we get our word what? Pharmacy or pharmaceuticals. And so here's, it says witchcraft. And the idea is these people want some kind of enchantment. They want something that's out there. They want something that will lift them, that will take them beyond where they are. And oftentimes drugs or medicinals are used in the process of that. Witchcraft. Hatred. This is more in the passive thing. It means relational alienation. I'm not going to go up to them and say, I hate you. I'm just not going to have anything to do with them. Hatred. Relational alienation. Discord is the active. While hatred is the passive Discord is the active. It means strife. It means bring it on, buddy. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to quarrel. You're going to get a piece of my mind. Discord. Jealousy is actually an onomatopoeic word that mimics the sound of water bubbling over from boiling. And so it's this idea, I'm jealous. I'm incensed that they are advancing. And I'm not. I'm jealous of someone else's advancements. Fits of rage. I look at fits of rage. Um, It's angry outbursts, but like a suicide bomber, they detonate themselves to damage everyone around. Just think of that image. Fits of rage. I'm going to blow myself up to damage everyone else around me and cause problems. Selfish ambition. It's a rivalry. It's an ambition for self over others. It's a carnal feud for the seeking of followers. I want this for me. I don't want this for them. Then the next ones, these are all acts of the flesh, desires of the flesh. Division is a desire of the flesh. Separating people from each other by what we say or do. To stand separately to intentionally separate people from each other. Factions, a desire of the flesh, creating a sect or party over a personal choice or opinion. Now, oftentimes when I think of factions, I end up thinking politically. Like, okay, you have your Democrats, you have your Republicans, you have your independent party, whatever may be the case. And we look at these factions. But you know, every time this word is used in the New Testament, he's talking about church. He says, you know, people have their personal opinions, their personal ideals, and they will go and make them spiritual and cause separation within the body of Christ over personal choice or opinion. They'll justify it by spirituality when it's really a personal choice and they create factions. Envy means decay, means I'm glad for another's misfortune or pain, drunkenness, excess drinking to the loss of discernment. And then orgies, unbridled activity that can accompany drinking and carousing. Now, these are no-brainers, right? We all sit in church and you're like, oh, yeah, we agree. No-brainers. But can I just say, 
We have all been intoxicated by our desires to the point where our judgment is thrown off. Every one of us. I sat in my office once with a couple with whom one of the spouse was just uncovered to be in a two and a half year affair. And as this was uncovered, the person says to me, you ready for this one? They say, but we prayed about it. We had devotions together. We felt we could even go into ministry and maybe even do missions trips together. Now, that is like classic example of being intoxicated by our desires, but still saying, hey, I can drive this thing. I can still, I can still handle it. And we justify in our minds what we're doing. In fact, this person even said, God told me. God told me that it's okay. And the only thing I can say is, you know, that's not God talking. That's the liquor of our personal desires talking. You know what I'm saying? That is not the spirit of God. The text is obvious. That is the work of our flesh. It's allowing our intoxicating desire to take over to the point where we justify, we play around, we think we can self-navigate and drive the car in that condition, and we just can't. And so here, let's just talk openly and honestly about this. How do we live under the influence of our natural desires? How to live under the influence of our natural desires? I'm going to tell you how you can live under the influence of your natural desires. Here's the answer. Do nothing. They're natural. We don't need to do anything to stir them up. They are implanted within us from the fall. And when we let nature run its course in our minds, some obvious things happen. I'm going to open up with you. Will you open up with me on this too? How many people, friends, how many people have we chewed out, beaten up, wished for dead, had vindictive thoughts, hoped for their demise, celebrated at their misfortune, all in here? How many people have we had those thoughts about? How many fights, how many affairs, how many arguments, how many anxieties have occurred in our hearts from our desires? And we don't need to do anything to make that happen. They come like that because they are natural. I'm going to give you a verse that follows this. It sets it right up. It's from James 1, 13 to 15. It says, when tempted... Follow it up on the screen. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. No. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Would you read this next sentence with me, starting with, but each person? Let's say it together. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Boom. Comes from here. That's where it starts. And then James finishes. He says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it is finished or full grown, it gives birth to death. It starts in here. Some people say, well, the devil made me do it. Let me just tell you, folks, the devil has the easiest job in the world because we already have natural impulses and desires that are intoxicating 
Samson couldn't blame his poor judgment on others. <clears throat> now, if you remember, after the garden sin of Adam and Eve, they had two boys, Cain and Abel. <clears throat> and Cain went ahead and killed Abel out of jealousy for God's approval on his sacrifices. And, and you know, and they, and they couldn't say, oh, it's those stupid neighbor kids. I know that they would cause trouble with our kids. I knew it. They couldn't say it's that rock music. Or you know it's that education system. You know, when they switched political parties, it all went downhill from there. Because it all started right here with population four in the world one of the most heinous sins popped up. And it's because individuals have this natural desire to be full of themselves and our desires. And there's no wonder why people aren't full of God's spirit when they're full of that. And notice how serious this is. This is crazy serious. Because in Galatians 5, Paul says, you know what, and I warn you. Like, this is the strictest warning. He says, I'm just here to tell you, folks, this is heart attack serious right now. I'm warning you that people that are like this, those who live like this, this is not stuff that is made up of the kingdom of God. We need to do a heart check. If I'm always after these desires. If I don't desire God, then where are we? Because filling ourselves with our natural desires can be an indication that we aren't God's child to begin with. It's a warning. So here's the truth. Here's the truth to grapple with this morning. <clears throat> the first step to filling is emptying. The first step to filling is emptying. I'm going to say it one more time. The first step to filling is what? It's emptying. The scriptures say you can't be filled with both. They war against each other. And that first step we need to take, and I'm just going to talk plainly. This may be something you were not expecting to hear in church this morning. I'm going to talk about our desires because I know that in our world and in the church is no different. We deal with natural desires. And one of them, flat out, is the first Greek word we talked about, pornea. It's pornography. It is sexual fantasizing. And we need to be honest about our desires. It's there we need to realize, friends, our internal struggles with that, with language, with relational discord, with fits, with hatred, with church divisions over opinions, with selfishness, with hidden agendas, with pride, with being hooked on a feeling. Like, these are all things. that we can fill ourselves with. And if we're full of them, we won't be full of God's Spirit to work in our lives. So the first step to filling is emptying. We need to pull the plug on things that we're letting live in our life. And we need to be honest about it. I'm going to give us three things as we finish up. <clears throat> I want to be very practical with you. The very first one is we need to identify personal weaknesses. We need to be honest. We need to be real. We need to be authentic. I know we're in church. We all look great or whatever, but here's the truth. We all deal with something, every one of us. 
and we need to be honest. If we fool ourselves, hey, I can handle this. I can drive. I've got it all under control. We're not being honest. We're not being authentic. We're not being real. And we need to identify our weaknesses. And maybe if we're wondering, is this a weakness? Maybe we turn to someone that we trust, that we love, and say, hey, talk to me. What do you see in me? And give them a permission slip like I'm, I just want you to be open. I'm not going to be mad. You tell me what you see, what you hear from me. But we need to be honest. If we aren't honest, we'll never get past this step of emptying. Then we need to set up an exit strategy. Set up an exit strategy. And the first part of the exit strategy is with God. God, I need your help. God, I confess my sin. I confess my desires. Now, this is not going to be a shock to him because he sees it already. But God, you see my heart. You know where I'm weak. You know where I struggle. You know whatever it is, and I confess it to you, and I need your help from within. I can't do this on my own. And then set up an exit strategy, maybe with someone else. And I think that that's crucial. With someone that loves and cares for you and is investing in you, we need to set up an exit strategy. And if it's with pornography, maybe with that individual, you set up covenant eyes on your computer or on your phone. If it's an attitude issue, get a partner to to talk to you personally and plainly. If it's motives... Allow someone to be honest with you. We need, if I can even put it this way, we need designated drivers in our lives to help us deal with the intoxication of our fleshly desires. We need to pull the plug. And here's the third thing, and this is what we're going to talk about next week. Then we need to fill up with the things of the Spirit of God, replace with the fruit of His Spirit. In place of immorality or hatred, love. In place of bitterness or wanting a high, joy. Rather than discord or factions or selfish ambition, peace. That's next week. But the first step to filling is emptying the first step to being full with his spirit is being empty of ourselves now this shouldn't surprise us this is how christianity is from the very beginning because when we come to jesus christ at the beginning we don't say god here's who i am and here's all my great stuff he wants us to be empty And to accept him for all that he is. And so Jesus even said, if anyone wants to follow after me, he must first deny himself. I'm done with me. Take up his cross and follow me. So being empty and coming to Jesus to accept his gift of salvation, that's the way it started from the beginning and it goes all the way through. Two of the songs I think about from my earliest years just as I am without one plea. Like, I got nothing. God, I've got nothing. In fact, what I do have, it ain't going to work. I need you. The other one, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a what? A wretch like me. It's me, God. It's me. You know my desires. I'm wretched. And I need you. And so for some here today, coming to grips with how Christianity starts may be your next step. I believe God and know that I'm a sinner. And I know that Jesus died on the cross for me, for my sin. He bore the penalty for my sin on the cross. And that may be your prayer today. God, Forgive me. I trust in Jesus. Be my forgiver and my leader in my life. 
that's your first step. And maybe that's your prayer today. The other prayer is, God, you know my heart, you know my struggles, you know my challenges. Forgive me. I need to empty of this to be full of you. Help me. That's your prayer. Would you stand with me for a moment? What is your prayer today? What's your prayer? <clears throat> is it the prayer of beginning that I accept Jesus? I want God a relationship with you. I believe Jesus died for my sin. Is that your prayer today? Then do that. Is your prayer, God, I confess? You know my heart. You know my struggles. Forgive me. Help me. And then think of someone you can link with. But whatever your prayer is, would you say it right now in your heart to God? Talk to him. Let's be honest with him. I'll give you a moment. Father, you know us better than anyone. Our hearts are open before you. And I pray, Lord, that through this time and through the work of your Spirit, that you will nudge us to take the next step. God, help and hear our prayers. Help us to draw closer to you. Whether it be for the first time or whether it be for the hundredth time, help us to empty ourselves of ourselves, to be filled with you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, in his powerful name. And together we say, amen, amen. And let me just tell you as we finish, if you need help, you chat. Come to us. Um, talk, talk to any of our staff, our support staff. Call us in the office or email us through our links online. Let's talk about it. Okay, let's do this thing. Talk to people that are a close friend of yours, that are close to God. Talk to them. This isn't just a message, friends. This is a model that God wants to follow. Let's take the next step forward. Talk in your small group. Talk to someone close to you. But let's move forward. God bless you. I'm going to say to you, be filled. But I'm going to say, but first, be empty. Be empty. Yeah. See in the foyer. And see the new members downstairs. Take care. <laughs>